Hello and welcome to the first episode of Eco Insiders. This is a show that's going to bring you up close and personal with the professionals who are working on the forefront of sustainability in business. I'm James and joining me is my co-host Richard. We're here to chat with sustainability professionals about the projects they are working on and also on what drives them on a personal level. Today, we're diving in with Henk Jelle Reitsma with a 15-year career in risk management, regulatory compliance and finance domains. Henk Jelle recently launched a brand new consultancy called RiskSphere. We wanted to learn more about this new journey, and I started asking Henk Jelle about his aha moment when he decided to make that firm commitment to focus on sustainability. Hello, Henk Jelle. Good to see you online. It's good to have you uh, on this show. Glad to be here. And Richard, my co-host, calling in from Shanghai. Is it not too late for you? It's not too late. Hi, everyone. This is Richard. Okay. So, first of all, I'd like to say that as a Dutch person, I'm able to pronounce Henk Jelle's name. So, on our uh, show today is Henk Jelle Reitsma. And can you provide listeners with an overview of your background and a brief intro of Risk Sphere? Sure. Once again, happy to be here. And my name is Henk Jelle Reitsma. I can also pronounce my own name, which is a Dutch person is very handy. I'm 47 years old. I live in the Netherlands. I've been working in the banking industry for about 17 years now. Not with a very particular background. I'm a neuropsychologist by training, but I also studied user system interaction on technical university, and I did a master of science in management. So I have a very broad background, ended up in a traineeship at one of the largest banks in the Netherlands, kind of got stuck in the whole banking industry and kind of also got stuck in regulatory compliance, risk management, finance domains. So I've been doing that as a consultant for about 10 years. Then I moved to the business for about four years and now moved back into consulting. Did a very specific focus with the move back to consulting. I mean, is that I wanted to take kind of leverage on the knowledge and the skills that I had developed in the, since about 2018, 19, climate risk, stress testing, climate modeling, ESG reporting. I thought, well, if I had my say, and I have because it's my life and I can do whatever I want, I would want to go back to consulting and I want to build a boutique consultancy around regulatory compliance in the ESG sustainability domain, which has become RiskSphere, which we started January 1st last. So what was really like that moment? I mean, how did it, that aha moment arrive for you? Was it kind of a slowly then gradually moment that move into sustainability to kind of really make that commitment? Kind of seemed like you were looking into that 2019 onwards, but obviously it was playing in the background or integrated in the issues you were covering before then. Sure, but very much in the background. I think that's a very true thing to say. I mean, one of the funny things is that what we now call ESG, SDG, sustainability, has been around in various incarnations for decades now. So corporate social responsibility, people, planet, profit. So it was always kind of there, but was kind of a department for that or something like it. There was, it was important, but we have a sustainability officer or something. Uh, we have a CSR department. And the idea that it has become more on the background, not only for financial services, but for companies in general, because from a societal point of view, it is expected from you to be, to have it more on the background. And it has become a hygiene factor for your reputational risk. And your, that has really been a pivotal moment, I think. It was actually quite funny because it's when we did our first, I was still working at the bank at that point in time, in 2018, 19, we decided to do a climate risk stress test, which was not mandatory then yet for banks. And, but we had some time left and we thought, well, we'll do one. To be honest, I thought, well, it's a bit of a, a hype kind of thing. Everybody wants to do something with climate or something. But I didn't quite feel the importance yet. But we did it, and when it was interesting, we did some flood risk scenarios, as most banks do. It's like uh, the, uh, half of the Netherlands becomes flooded, which is very easy because we are already on the water, Richard. So we just have to break two dikes, and we're there. But it's more like if it becomes in the next 10, 20, 30 years, this becomes a reality, then 
obviously the livelihood of the Netherlands. And there, uh, with that, for example, the collateral value of a bank would drastically change, right? So we did this kind of exercise and I thought, well, it's kind of interesting. And then kind of the momentum came on from the ECB, a European Central Bank, for international listeners, the big regulator within the Eurozone, who was really mandated to task banks to make more work of ESG reporting, climate risk reporting, climate action plan. So that was a moment that it really came to the foreground. And that's a bit of a cynical view, but for a bank, especially in the Eurozone, I don't particularly know other regions apart from America, but for something to become top of mind, it has to become regulatory driven. So that was a kind of a big change for me. And I thought it was because it's a topic which has at least three dimensions, which I find very interesting. The first is, I think it's intrinsically important. So if I can do two things, and one is a project for a client, and the other is a project for a client, which gives them slightly more insight into the way the role they can play in, in the transition to a more sustainable future, I would always choose the latter above them. So that's one. But the second is that I think it's a very intellectually very challenging topic because it's very, very much in development. Nobody really knows what next year will bring and how we're going to fix this and that. And it's a long-term issue of or theme with very real today implications. So it's intellectually challenging. And I think it's business-wise, if, if you've asked me last year, like you have to build a consultancy firm and you have to choose within 10 minutes a topic, I would probably also have chosen sustainability because it's just one of the biggest topics where, because our clients need so many much help, I think there is a lot of business-wise, it's also very interesting. And not talking about the candidates because a lot of consultants want to make the move to sustainability and ESG. So also from an employer perspective, it's also very interesting. I love the way you frame that up. And I think, again, and going back to why we're here, three of us having a conversation in this new series is that a couple of decades ago, it was in the background and it's now front and center. So the actions that could have happened several decades ago would have avoided it being front and center, but that's kind of how it had to manifest for humans to start working on it. And again, like you mentioned, it started off in a functional silo called CSR. I remember in Beijing in the late 2000s that there were a lot of CSR heads and everyone in that field are considered to be experts today and are more enterprise-wide advising on sustainability. But like you said, there's a lot of pieces and complexity to unpack that. And I think that from my side, at least Richard, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm excited about this conversation we're having today and also the conversations that are going to be coming from here is that it's not learning by doing, but learning by podcasting. So obviously... We want to be talking by, to people that are on the front of it, who are really like doing it in their daily professional life pretty much 90% of the time. But then again, sustainability is going to be going into all of our job functions. So I hope that we can get into these kind of topics in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. And before I go back to you, I would also like to say that there is this idea that what will be a healthy company in the future. And a healthy company of the future, I would argue, is a profitable and sustainable company. There are a lot of companies that are profitable, and there may be also companies that are sustainable. But bringing those two together will have to become mainstream. 100%. But tell us about the actual start of Risk Sphere, because that was the moment that it really became front and center, and you took all your experience that you had and with colleagues can really sort of tackle it head on. Uh, if you could tell our listeners and us the whole story of Risk Sphere, it's obviously not even one year old, so it's a very exciting brand new consultancy. Yeah, that's true. And I think last somewhere in the summer of last year, I thought, well, if I'm going to make this pivot back to consultancy and into this domain of ESG, sustainability, ESDGs, which is not a very, which is still very broad, right? So, but Obviously, given my background from a regulatory perspective, would be obvious. 
I think that would be an obvious choice for me to approach it from a banking or financial services regulatory perspective and then make it the pivot into the ESG. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it myself. So I'm not going to join a big four because I think there is an enormous growth in consultants at all existing consulting firms with a focus on the same domains and also trying to help clients. But I thought I was always also at the moment in my career that I thought, well, I'm not going to fit anymore into an existing culture and an existing proposition set or whatever. I'm going to do what I like. So that's, I think one of the biggest mantras of actually starting something myself was the idea that I was only going to do impactful projects at great clients with great people. And if you want to do that, you have to have to be able to call the shots and not be an account manager for a big four firm for one of your biggest clients. And then you still have to do whatever they tell you to do. And I thought it would be just extremely fun to try to pull it off, to start something from nothing. So somewhere in Q4 last year, I thought up a name, I had some other names in it. Then it was thought risk sphere would be nice because it's risk, obviously, and sphere is the world. And it, it, you, my art development, I don't know exactly the word, but somebody who works with, who helps you with the artwork was very happy with the name because a sphere is very nice. You can build great logos with it. And suddenly it was something, there was a logo, there was a brand book. And then I think everybody who starts a company has this one moment where somebody says, I would like to join you, which is like, a watershed moment in like it's not longer your dream or your idea but suddenly somebody says you can i would like to join you so your first employee is like big time right and then suddenly you have to decide where are we going to focus on and what are we not going to do which is also very much a very interesting question and we decided to focus on three topics which is all are in the financial services domain and slightly beyond that which is one is stress testing and scenario analysis, which is very much my cup of tea and has been for the last 15 years. The general ESG and sustainability risk, project management and program management and reporting. And especially the reporting side is a very big thing with all kinds of guidelines kind of falling over each other and converging and then diverging again. So clients need a lot of help there also with the data. So we made this decision to go for these three propositions and suddenly there is a website. Well, not suddenly, it took a lot of time and it took a lot of money. But then there's a website and then now we're with five growing to eight this year. So suddenly there's like this little culture created as well. So from absolutely nothing in summer last year until, and, and we're now 27th of this September, one year later and there's Five people with two or three people in the pipeline, and it's there's something. I think that everybody who ever created a company, whether it's a boutique consultancy or a bakery or a whatever, it must be the same kind of exhilarating experience that you've created something which was not there yet. Yes, yeah, speaking of your website, I uh, check it out uh, briefly. On your core values, you put, uh, we believe in doing well by doing good. I'm wondering, is that something you form at the very beginning, like day one of you setting up the company, or is it some values you gradually created with a couple of co-founders as you assembled the team? I kind of stole it, which is, I think, okay. Uh, you had a former CEO of Unilever, Paul Polman, who tried to really change Unilever for almost to a point where he said uh, Unilever is not longer a company, but it's the biggest NGO in the world or something like He took it kind of up to breaking point. He bended it up to breaking point. But one of his mantras was doing well by doing good. And what he meant is there is should be no distinction that kind of circles back to the remark you made earlier, James, is a good company is a profitable company, which is sustainable. So there should be no trade-off between either you're doing good and then you're an NGO or you're another nonprofit or you're making money and you're a capitalist pig and you're uh, destroying the world. That's a false paradox. So it's perfectly fine to work 
in a domain where you try to work towards the greater good of the world and you and not just in client in terms of climate but also socially and also in terms of governance and the, the full spectrum and still be a very profitable company which makes money and there's no you don't have to be ashamed of that anymore just going back to the beginning there was clearly a great name a team ethos an exciting beginning to the journey but behind that was of course probably a client or the market saying please come in and do this yeah 100 we actually the company was created on a demand and not so much as, as a supply so the, i was not sitting somewhere thinking that this is such a good idea now i just have to sell it i was actually contacted all the time by clients and people in my network who said if you're moving back into consultancy if you have time could you work on and eight out of ten times that would be something with esg reporting stress testing uh, climate stress testing or some project management in that domain so one in particular has really stood out for me is a promotional bank which is a bit of a technical term but you have in the netherlands you have a or actually in Euro, in whole Europe, you have uh, something called a promotional bank, which is a bank, but not so, one where you can actually take a deposit or a card from, but which has a very specific tasks for the government. And the government is not in the business of owning banks. You wouldn't say after the great financial crisis, because they, most of them had to be nationalized, but they don't want that actually. So if you have a very specific task, which needs to be done and you can't leave it to the market. You, you create something which is called a promotional bank. And in the Netherlands, you have two of those, the BNG and NWB. And BNG is the Bank Nederlandse Gemeente, which is for the municipalities. And the NWB is the Nederlandse Waterschapsbank, which is the Dutch Water Bank, which kind of gives it away. It's a big lender and financer of everything water related, which is very, very spot on for the country we live in, obviously, because it's, it's one of, uh, as we said earlier, we're below sea level and we've been fighting the water for uh, centuries now. But it's also very much in the heart of the whole climate change and the climate transition debate, because they are actually a risk mitigant. If, if you actually finance the dikes and the waterworks, and then you're obviously at the heart of everything climate and water sea level related so even more ways than a typical mortgage lender or whatever in what city you, uh, you want coming back to your expertise which was uh stress testing and scenario planning and analysis bring this into the kind of the esg climate space and sort of finally you know being able to invent the wheel is kind of the opposite of the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it broke. So we got to fix it in a new way. So with your first anchor client into this new kind of construct with your new colleagues, how have you in that specific service, how have you seen that evolve in the project that you were doing over the past year? And maybe you could speak a bit to some more details so that you could share on the journey you've been so far in this particular case study. Yeah, I think I've been extremely lucky in that sense with um, a client which is by definition a very long-term invested client. The project this particular client finances is are by definition long-term projects. Otherwise, they could leave it to the market. But if you have to finance something which should be there for 50 or 80 years, then obviously you have a kind of a long view on things. And that really helped from a board perspective traction and also urgency on the idea that you could also approach uh, sustainability on a long-term view. Whereas most companies, I think, and even banks, but uh, most companies in general are very much in the here and now and have a horizon of maybe one, two, three years. And if it does, this client really is in its DNA, it has a long view of things. So uh, the only thing I had to do was help them understand that sustainability also needs that long view in terms of the impact that you create, uh, but also the risks that are involved. So just to give an, an other way of answering that question, the European Central Bank as a regulator asked the majority of banks in the Eurozone last year to do something called a climate stress test. 
a stress test in banking perspective has about a three, four, maybe five year horizon, depending on the bank and depending on your uh, methodology. So they did this kind of what they call a horizontal view. They asked every bank exactly the same. They aggregated the results and the results were that it was not really bad because to be honest, this is obviously a very incremental risk. So there's not really a big risk next year or maybe not even a year after that, but in 20, 30, 40 years time, we're too late. So uh, stress testing is an extremely useful tool, but it was actually not very useful to create urgency on the topic of climate transition. So I think the European Commission or European Parliament asked the European Central Bank to do, or at least mandated the European Central Bank to do a climate stress test to create urgency in the market for that we now really, really have to act. And the result was that most people thought, well, actually not that bad. So you actually have annual reports here. I think I found a, a, a Nordic bank who in its annual report said we're not going to take any capital for the results of the climate stress test because we're not, uh, it doesn't touch us. But the sub-sentence behind that would be not with a horizon of three years, but obviously maybe you're out of business in 20 years because your country has changed beyond recognition. So there are a lot of tools in the toolbox, but you actually have to find something which is useful in this situation. I think stress testing can be useful, but only in combination with a long view, which is scenario analysis with a 20, 30, maybe 50 year horizon. And using these tools to kind of deepen and broaden your insights and also help you make decisions from the board level in the here and now is something which Shell has been doing for 50, 60, 70 years. And is because it's also very capital intensive and because they also have to make decisions which are not beneficial on one year or two year, but maybe have to, if you build an oil platform, it has to be there for 50 years. So you really have to think about that long term. So that whole scenario analysis methodology and the philosophy behind it is really from the it was not invented at Shell and BP, but it became big at Shell and BP for exactly the same reasons that it is very beneficial for the climate and the sustainability domain, namely that it's, it helps you create insights about the very long term and make decisions in the here and now. I'm sure Richard has a question. Otherwise, I've got definitely one up my sleeve. <laughs> Richard, do you want to jump in at any moment? Yeah, it's, uh, this stress testing concept is really interesting because when we talk about climate change and sustainability in general, we tend to think, oh, this is something that's going to happen in the future. But the other day when I was browsing through LinkedIn, I saw a statement that's really fascinating that it says, stop saying climate will change. Climate has already changed. So I think really this concept of stress testing to see what will happen, to visualize what will happen in the future and drive decision now, it's really valuable. So I'm wondering how does it work in practice when you run this stress testing for this promotional bank? What tools, methodologies, process did you use to run the, run the testing itself? Yeah, not particularly for this promotional bank, but in general, what you do in stress testing in banks is that you take a scenario and that could be a macroeconomic scenario or an interest rate hike or big increase in default rates uh, at clients or whatever. You take something which is very bad and then you kind of calculate the financial implications of that scenario. So you create a very bad scenario, which has to be, and that's written in the guidelines, it has to be severe but plausible. So you can't really get alien invasions from outer space or pigs taking over the world. It has to be something which is plausible but very severe. And then you put it in all kinds of engines, and it calculates uh, the impact on profitability, capital ratios, leverage ratios. And at the end, you kind of write like, we survived, barely, but we survived. So this scenario, we could have uh, survived. That, that's the insight that you create. You also have something which is called a reverse stress test, 
and you have to do those every once in a while as well, where you start on the other side of the spectrum and you start with, we don't survive, or at least we breach our capital ratios, which are mandatory, or we breach the leverage ratio, which we should not breach. And then you create a scenario with reverse engineering, which would create that situation. So that also learns you a lot about what can happen in the world and how vulnerable, where your vulnerabilities are. So that's typically stress testing for you, but with a horizon of three, four, five years. So most of the time, something really ha- bad happens in year one, and then you have some recovery in year two and three, and in year four, if you're still alive, you've passed the stress test. And that also, that's the point with me uh, explaining that climate change, for example, or societal unrest or human rights violations, are, which are more a gradual decline into a less than desirable world. Maybe this is a very good tool, but not for this. So, But if all you've got is a hammer, everything you see is a nail. And I think that's what, what really happened with the regulators is that they are very, very well first in putting forward stress testing scenarios and asking banks to put that, but they found out that this was just not a really good methodology to create the urgency that you need for everybody to act, especially the longer-term insights that will help you understand whether you have a long-term viable business model. And a business model has two sides, right? You, You have to think about your revenue streams going forward. So if something dries up or if something becomes anathema, then you have to have a plan in place to kind of make that shift strategically or tactically in your product line. The other thing is profit is two things, right? So it's revenue and costs. And I think one very interesting thing, which we haven't touched upon yet, is are we going to kind of do a true price cost? So if a company creates a product and the social cost is with the people that are exploited building the product and the cost to the environment is being cleaned up by uh, taxpayers' money, are we going to redirect those true costs of a product or a service or an industry to the polluter? And if that happens, then your cost base will obviously go through the roof for some industries and there is no viable product anymore. So the I think there are numerous industries which are only profitable because they don't bear the costs, the actual true costs of what they create. But the costs are diversified across the society and the benefits, the revenue is centered in the company. And if there's a policy shift, even a tilting of the policy shift towards a more distributed level of cost sharing, then you will also see a lot of changes within industries, I'm, I'm quite sure. So that w- those were two things. Like you said, that you have to long-term viability of the business model is not so much from the stress testing kind of thing, but I think it's more like if you really start thinking about your company within an industry, within society, politically, economically, social, technological, so the best indicators, if you start trying to look into the future in a 10, 20, 30, 40 years time horizon, then you you have to create a business model which will deal with that whole range of possible future scenarios. And the whole point of scenario analysis is not predicting the future, but being more resilient for whatever future will come. And it will help if you think about a whole range of futures And then the one that will come will not become as a surprise, but it will most likely be a variant of some sort, which you will be more resilient to. And that's also in terms of profit and product lines and go to markets and whatever. And I think the other big thing is the policy changing. It will be, I think, and it's true to my heart, right? That if we take ESG, but we only take the E, the environmental, and within environmental, we only take climate. So we really scope the whole issue. I think the biggest threat to most companies is not physical transition, but policy change. So as soon as it becomes, if we reach a tipping point in, in a society, in a political way, and politics, for example, here in Europe, if the European Parliament says, okay, we're done with this, we're going to ban this. We're gone with subsidizing stuff and kind of promoting stuff. And that there's a ban on 
gasoline cars as of 2024 in the whole of Europe. Then whole industries will vaporize within years and others will come up mushrooms in a couple of years. So I think that's a bigger threat to the long-term viability of most companies than whether or not there will be a sea level increase or extreme weather. I think these are already here and we have to do everything we can to mitigate them becoming more real and more threatening. But if I have a company, I would be more serious about lobbying and working in Europe and within with regulators because the biggest risk for most companies will come from letters on paper and not from water from the ocean. That's well put. This kind of brings us to the topic of uh, stakeholders and stakeholder alignment, because I think one of the, well, two parts. One is that within an industry, there are multiple players and certain companies may be each other suppliers and competitors uh, in one. So according to business logic in a world where, let's say, going back to the, the Pralahad and Hamel and management thinkers of the 80s, you need to focus on your core competency. And in an efficient market, uh, companies end up kind of where they are meant to be in a most efficient way. And yet now, what is needed is dialogue. Yet dialogue often is constrained by the potential of having this partner supplier say, we could work on the solution, but there's also a possibility they could have a different agenda. And so there's that piece between various sort of private companies or let's say publicly listed companies cooperating. And then there's the public institutions, policymakers. So there, there is this point of a business case, which can be profitable or unprofitable, or maybe it's not possible to silo it in the sense that you need to bring a number of companies together and work with public institutions. So it seems to be going against the grain of focusing into a neat business case. And it requires so much complexity. And I imagine that's also where you come in, not so much with the predicting of scenario planning, but looking at some of your other services. Could you talk a bit about how you imagine this complicated process of bringing various industry stakeholders and policymakers around the table? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think this is a really relevant question. But it's also not a unique situation, I find. So it's a very, we can actually find some inspiration from historical analogs. One of them being, for example, the textile industry, where you had shops at some point in time. And then when there was a public outrage that the clothes that they were selling were too cheap and they were exploiting people in Bangladesh before, companies used to say, and I'm overgeneralizing here, right? But Shops could say, yeah, but we only sell the clothes. And the makers of clothes could say, yeah, but we've kind of outsourced it to another company. It's a factory somewhere. At some point, that didn't, that was an argument until it wasn't, because people didn't tolerate that argument anymore. They say, you have a chain responsibility. First, it was a kind of a reputational kind of moral obligation, like to have you have your chain in order. And then it became, the law. And I think it's happened the same in client due diligence or anti-money laundering. Like in the 80s, 90s, if you've asked anyone within a bank whose job is it to detect anti-money laundering, they would have said, well, it's the IRS or some kind of government institution because, I mean, we're just a bank. And then when governments try to push that into the business case of a bank, at some point, they said, yeah, now you ha you're uh, responsible for your, knowing your client and customer due diligence. And you have about 10 or 15 years and then say, okay, if you still haven't got your act together, we're going to fine you. So I think James knows this, but three out of, four of the four biggest banks in the Netherlands have received fines from upwards of 450 million euros in the last couple of years because of lacking compliance and lacking anti money laundering. That would have been absolutely unthinkable in the 80s or 90s. So, and that's also kind of a chain responsibility. Like you can't say like my business stops here and now it's somebody else's business and I'm not involved anymore because I don't have a moral obligation. 
And I think that will also is already happening here with a, a chain and also multiple stakeholders involved in solving issues. And that also makes things extremely complex, right? So if I am a builder and I ask a bank for a loan because I want to uh, renovate a whole area within a city and I want to make it climate neutral and I would put solar panels on the roofs and then some investigative journalist finds out that those solar panels were made using child labor and then suddenly I'm kind of I have a big plus on the E because I've been working towards climate zero, but I'm actually reputational wise, I'm down the drain because I've been involved through all kinds of numerous subcontractors into something which I would never have wanted to be involved in. So it doesn't, it's kind of an echo of these kinds of things. I'm absolutely sure. And you already see it. And that's an answer to your question, James, is with AESG reporting, with the whole scope one, scope two, scope three, that it's kind of built in by design into the legislation or it's being built in. If I have a company, I have to report on my scope one. So that takes care of the fact that all the managers drive a Tesla and, they, and, they, and we kind of isolate, insulate the building, right? So scope one is perfect. Scope two is what are you financing? Do you have an exclusion list? Do you want to be involved in? fossil fuels or whatever and then you have kind of what are people doing with what you are making and that becomes a chain responsibility which you actually have to report on periodically so that's one thing that they got right this time i think is that they understood that you have multiple stakeholders you have the public private dance i would almost say like uh, waiting for policies but also trying to shape policy on the other hand and also trying to shape a company benchmark and then you have this chain responsibility by design through esg reporting and the various scopes that you have to take into account so i don't think we have to wait one or two years for our first fine exceeding 100 million for a company who said well we didn't actually do something wrong ourselves, but what happened with what we did was very bad. And we could have known, and then the argument will always be from a, a regulated kind of side or a, poly, or a government, always be either you knew and that makes you bad, or you didn't know and that makes you incompetent, and both are not good. So it really doesn't matter. So just turning now to another direction. So, yeah. As always, there's a strategy, there's a plan, but there's the people that have to actually make it happen. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on both sort of senior managerial talent of all facets, all layers in the company functions. There is a kind of increasing need for specific skill sets to help lead uh, projects and initiatives within companies. And obviously, as I was saying at the beginning, there's a CSR backdrop of 20 years ago and a kind of a pool of people that came out of that. But again, you can imagine that there is um, a lot of um, evolution of people's roles that have uh, increasingly turned into a kind of an ESG-focused uh, approach, just like yourself, where you started your own company. So I'm curious to hear how you see this going in this decade in terms of upskilling, and also even some noise in the marketplace, just like companies are talking a lot of the talk and maybe not walking the walk. How do you distinguish between a sudden flurry of new experts that are ESG sustainability experts? And how can you help kind of clients to, to kind of build the right talent pools as well for their own transformation? That's a very, very valid point, right? So I saw this cartoon on LinkedIn a couple of times where you have the fastest species in the world, and then you had a Jaguar, and then you had a ESG consultants, which outran everybody because they suddenly everybody has ESG. Or, so it, there's a lot of greenwashing of skills, also with the best intentions, right? So suddenly everybody who has uh, two or three years of some exposure to the domain is suddenly an expert. And I think that's not bad. I mean... In three years' time, those same people, if they really focus, are five, six years into the game, and that's all fine, right? So it's also kind of a 
a declaration of interest to some extent, as long as you don't claim to know the world and don't overclaim your your knowledge skills and don't overestimate because there's a bit of the Kruger Denner effect here. Yeah? Like you read three books and you think you're an expert and you read 100 books and you understand that you're an amateur. And that's also a bit here. Like uh, most people uh, listen to a couple of podcasts, read a book and have an opinion. As long as you know your limits, I think that's perfectly fine. But companies have to do to kind of weed through that a bit. And I think the, uh, one other thing is, and that's, and maybe that, that's an interesting kind of takeaway from a lot of scenario analysis work that I've been doing, and it's related to this, is that I've done a lot of workshops and a lot of sessions with boards and with various companies and various industries, and we've explored numerous scenarios and along various lines. And what we mostly do is, per scenario, in the future, we kind of... St- try to understand the start stop continue so if this happens we're in this scenario we really kind of emerge ourselves in this scenario what would we need to continue what would we need to stop what would we need to start in the here and now what we would we advise are the people back in 2023 to immediately do or don't or keep doing to help us in the here and now in 2050 and the one thing which is universal as a start is upgrade our our workforce in terms of knowledge. So we really have to get people on board who understand what's going on. And that could be from a technical methodological uh, kind, but it's also get somebody on board who actually knows how carbon works, not just talking about carbon or carbon exchanges or carbon offsetting or whatever but and the same might be true for nitrogen or for getting biologists on board if you want to talk about climate get a climatologist in your company and let him do pe sessions with all your management so you're you're not actually talking about the regulation or or your business case or whatever but you're actually understanding what you're doing and the same is true for so one of the clients i've been working with we did this whole session and they said, okay, we need to hire at least two people. One is a human rights expert and the other is a climatologist. Because in the coming five or 10 years, we either have to hire consultants all the time or we don't know what we talk about. So that's a very long answer to a very valid and, and slightly shorter question is, upskill your workforce and give people and it could be new people could also be give people who have the real drive to make a change and those are a lot right so especially along amongst the uh, 20 somethings 30 somethings give them the chance to develop into this internal give them a chance to develop into the domain they want to develop themselves in and if that's sustainability be their guest and in five or ten years time they are the experts that you need and they know your company in a, inside and out. Yeah, that's really interesting. But you just mentioned a case where you were talking about 2015 to 2023. I want to ask you, and I actually tried to pin you down onto one scenario rather than several futures. From a gut feel perspective, or you might be able to answer the question in, in two or three answers. Let's say we're in the year 2033. How do you expect business will have shifted? How far have, will we have gone in reaching that zero targets? And do you think we'll be actually having a global standard and sustainability that measures businesses like apples and apples and pears and pears? Yeah. Well, if you ask for my gut feeling, you'll get it. It's uh, There was this initiative amongst a couple of institutions within Europe. It's called the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS. And they made a matrix of we're either going to meet the targets of Paris or we're not. We're not going to meet it and we're going to be on time or not on time, something like that. They they created a couple of scenarios. And one of those scenarios is net zero 2030. So no, we're just going to work harder. And in 2030, we're net zero as by magic. And But there is another one which I like very much. And I think that's my, if I were to put my money on one of scenarios, then that would be this one. It's called delay transition. So we are going to 
change. But first of all, we're going to talk a lot about change. And then somewhere around 2030, 2030, 2028 or whatever, we're not going to do a lot of stuff. So it's going to be kind of a almost too little, too late. And then suddenly the delayed transition says, okay, but now governments step in and policy steps in and we're going to suddenly make a very drastic change. So it's not going to be gradual anymore. It's going to be really disruptive in terms of winding down total industries, uh, really forcing people to change their behavior. Uh, Maybe you get a ban on flights, which you have to ask beforehand if you can do the flight and you get granted access or not, something like that. So I believe in, we're talking a lot, nothing much will change, uh, not, not enough to really become, uh, to get anywhere near the Paris agreements. And at some point, you kind of don't let the market and consumers do it anymore, but you're going to make a very radical policy shift that requires an effort on a, on a global level between governments, which until a couple of years ago, I would not have thought feasible. But then COVID happened. And I think if the urgency and the, the, if it's urgent enough, suddenly everything is possible. So I think that if we create a world which is hot enough and which is unfair enough to the extension that we're actually on the brink of disintegration and really threatening our own human existence, then suddenly there will be a lot of possibilities. And I think that's somewhere in the 2030s that we really have to, we'll see things that we would not almost believe now that kind of an inter, almost global interference of governments in a kind of constructed and really collaborative way create a policy change which really puts us back where we belong. Yeah, you just uh, got me think that maybe we should also run this stress testing on personal level mm-hmm. <laughs> because I am already imagined in a world that I just cannot fly where I, I want it because some like behaviors I should have changed earlier to uh, deal with climate change. So yeah, just an interesting thought that how do we also drive urgency on, on a personal level for users or customers? Yeah, and I think that's a very nice take. And, and I'm, I thought it, it might sound a bit dark and dystopian or something, but I actually think that it's for the better of humankind that at some point you, you can ask people and companies like, mend your ways, mend your ways. And if you, if no, but at some point you say, okay, and now it's, it's, we're going to make you mend your ways. And we're going to close industries. We're going to create new industries. We're going to change human behavior as governments do have and have done for hundreds of years with public health, for example, like, trying to get people off smoking and putting a, a tax on. So it, there is already a lot of interference with your personal, and this is just taking it to another level and for another cause. And for accelerating someone's own learning at any sort of stage in their level of knowledge or experience, what are a couple of books that you could recommend for our listeners? I always like to close out each episode in this way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it, it won't come as a surprise as, as we've been talking about kind of a thinking scenario thinking and taking this long view that one of my, I would give two big recommendations for everybody who has been slightly interested in what we've been talking about. The one is a book called The Art of the Long View by Peter Swartz, uh, which is absolutely mind blowing. And it's, it gives a really nice introduction of the thinking around scenario analysis but also the way that they it was created almost bottom up like like demand driven you want to understand and the other is that's really in, you can use scenarios to create insights but then it what would it change in your behavior in the here and now which we also need to tackle climate change and and the transition to a more sustainable society i would recommend uh, the good ancestor by roman krisnarik who also takes this very long view, but combines it with what do you need to change in your thinking and your doing. And he gives a couple of, I think it's six tools to become a good ancestor uh, so that we can actually, what could you change in your ways now that 
your the children of your grandchildren's children will be very happy with you. And he mentioned things like a cathedral thinking and legacy mindset, which is really interesting to read as well. Well, thank you very much for that. I, we're definitely going to put those recommendations in the show notes. And I would love to have you back in the future where we talk again more specifically about scenario planning and just uh, how that is evolving uh, with future projects uh, that you've applied that with clients on. How do listeners get in touch with you? What's the best way that uh, our audience can uh, connect with you? I think the easiest way, especially for people who, uh, when my name, uh, Roman Krishnarik, has, actually has it on his website. He's the only writer I know, the writer of The Good Ancestor, who has a, a sound bite on his website uh, pronouncing his uh, last name. Uh, it's not that bad with my name, but I, I won't spell my email here. But if you go to www.risksphere.nl, the Netherlands, you can find me easily and you can always get in touch with me. Or find me on LinkedIn and connect there. And I'm always happy to uh, have a conversation. Yes, sounds good. Really appreciate that you're uh, one of the first uh, in our new show and uh, getting onto this journey ourselves. So looking forward to have you back as well in the future. And Richard, any last uh, words from you? Yeah. On my honor to be here. So uh, thank you for having me. And it's been a very interesting conversation. And good luck with your show. Thank you. And see you next week in the Netherlands. Yes, will. <laughs> Well, that was episode one. Thanks for joining us on Eco Insiders. If you found value in today's conversation, please leave us a five-star review and comment. Your support helps us to reach more people. For those interested in sharing your company's sustainability story, or if you have a speaker you'd like to recommend, please reach out to us at podcast at ecoinsights.com. Also, if you have a research, strategy, or workshop initiative you'd like to discuss, you can just email me directly at james.loudon at iot1.com. We have another interesting guest lined up to share both personal drives and practical experiences in sustainability. You won't want to miss it, so please subscribe to stay updated. Stay tuned, and on behalf of Richard and myself, thanks for being part of this brand new community. Until next time, bye for now.